I love London. I absolutely love London. Both my parents, although my my mum had Scottish blood and French blood, they were both Londoners initially. So it's a city I've known since childhood. I never, I didn't live here till I was an adult, but I, you know, we were visiting London a lot. So it's always been a really special place to me. And there's such variety in London. You know, that's something that I really try and bring out in the Stripe books. You have phenomenally wealthy people living cheek by jowl with very deprived areas. And that, that there are so many layers to London. So I do really try and evoke London from the, you know, the seedy and the deprived all the way through to the very high end and, and elite. Research is important to me. I do like to to go to go to these places I'm writing about because although we have these amazing technological tools now, Google Maps is extraordinary, obviously, for a writer. I like to be able to actually smell it and feel it and hear accents and so on. It gives you a totally different feeling. So I do I do do quite a bit of research for Strike. With Neil, my husband, who's a doctor, I have run things past him. But I will norm my, my process is normally that I will research it because I know what I need for the plot. But then I'll check, is this correct? Have I got the wrong end of the stick on this drug or this, what this injury would do or what, what artery this would, knife would sever? And I'm proud to say he's mostly, um, he's mostly said, no, this is okay. But I, I prefer to do it that way around because I know what I need for the plot. So I have to go in on that level rather than getting all this information and then trying to make the plot work around that, you see. I, I keep using the word grounding, but yeah, they have familiar cafes they go to. There's it just as you do, just, just as we all do. You know, we know that one cafe that we really like the coffee or you might really like the owner and so they have their locals they have their local cafe strike has his favorite local the tottenham which is now renamed the flying horse and he likes that name change because he's an arsenal fan so he never really liked it being called the tottenham i think it would be a very unusual writer who said they hadn't been influenced by other writers because of course everything you take in is is influencing you fiction and reality, you know, all of it's in there. But I've certainly never consciously been influenced by another writer. I've always read a lot of crime fiction. I really enjoy it as a genre, and that's one of the reasons that I wanted to do it myself. I went in with a very specific aim. I wanted to write really a traditional whodunit rather than a police procedural within a modern setting. So I it, that took me a while to find the right character. I wanted someone very contemporary, and I think he is. You know, he's been, he was badly injured in a very recent war. But it's old fashioned in the sense that he is a private detective. He does not have access to DNA labs and so on. And in fact, that's an issue in this, in this current book, which is interesting to, to um, you know, to write around. So I knew what I wanted to do. And I, so from that, in that respect, yeah, I had been influenced because I, because I knew what I liked from other people. But in terms of plot or character, no, I've never, I've never taken anything from anyone else. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably quite aware of the, the things that have already been done. So I avoid those. There are a couple of characters that just persist in my head, definitely, more, more than others. It's not exactly that they speak to you. Well, no, I suppose they do really, because I sometimes get random lines of dialogue coming into my mind. And I think of them the way that you would think of a friend when, a mem when something triggers a memory of them. So yeah, I suppose they do, they really do live in your subconscious, some characters more than others. But obviously characters that you're with over multiple books, they really stay with you. They don't ever really leave you. I love epigraphs and other people's books if they're well chosen. So really that's why, you know, that's that's why I like them. And I also like the fact that they set they set the tone. This is an old fashioned who done it. This is not, you know, as I say, a police procedural. Um, they are really eclectic, but that would reflect my reading patterns, you know. So we go 
relatively highbrow at times with a fairy queen, queen, and then you, yeah, you've got blue blue oyster cultures in there, and I really enjoy that mix, you know, and it sets the tone for each specific plot. I think what music people listen to is very, it always tells you something important about them. And um, Strike's favorite singer is Tom Waits. I chose him carefully because Strike grew up with a mother who was, you know, she's always called a groupie, which is quite a painful thing to have your mother constantly called uh, in press and in music biographies. And she really liked rock. You know, so his father was a lead singer of a rock band. She loved Blue Oyster Cult. She was really obsessed by them. So I thought, Strike's really not going to like any of that. He is not going to want to listen to long-haired guitarists. This is, this is stuff he saw too much of in his childhood. The angel is in the detail, not the devil in the detail. So I love that. I love, I do, I absolutely love creating. I really do. Um, but it's lovely to have the contrast between doing those, those books, which are pure fantasy, and then moving into a very real London to try and create Strike and Robin. But you're still world building, you know, even though there may be real places within this, um, this particular detective world, you are still world building. You're you're built. You're building their world because there. How many people live in London? Eight million. Each of them has their own London. You know, it's impossible for any one person to to know all of London, to experience London in the same in the same way. And that's part of what I love about writing about a big city. Each person has their own individual city in their heads. So, yeah. For the Strike TV series, I can honestly, it's been one of my very happiest collaborations. I've loved it from start to finish. It's really nice. Just the whole thing is a great experience. The writer who's done most of the um, screenplays is uh, Tom Edge. He's a fantastic writer. We get on personally very, very well. You accept that TV requires something different. And I'm executive producer and Tom and I will talk about things, but I, you know, I think Tom would agree that I pretty much let him have his way, but I'm there, well, not even have his way. I'm happy with what he does. Like 95% of the time, I, I have no notes. It's, it's little tweaks. I met with him yesterday, and one of my tiny, tiny notes was, Stripe wouldn't call Barclay Sam. He's always gonna call him Barclay. You know, just tiny things, just to keep the character set where I want the character set. And Tom will do a few things that I think are fabulous. They work so well on TV, but they wouldn't work as well as in a novel. So yeah, I enjoy it. I really enjoy that process. And the two leads, actors, are phenomenal. And they are magnificent in the roles. I always get asked, do you always get asked? I think it's quite common when your work's been adapted for film or TV. Do you see the actors in your head? And no, I don't. I have a very clear sense of what they look like. And I'm always thinking of them rather than Tom and Holiday when I'm writing. But I've got no issue whatsoever if people are imagining Tom and Holiday when they're reading the books because I do think they do an amazing job. The most important thing is stopping the TV show doing things that I know are going to make it very difficult for us to get back on course later. You know, that's that's really it. It's I'm sometimes tweaking the wheel because I know where we're going and we really don't want to end up over there. And that's often small character points that in the moment, you know, play well in a scene, but you know you're gonna to have to contradict that completely in the next in the next book or show. So yeah, that's that's my usefulness. Well, I've had two um, situations where I have had quite a, a meaningful talk with actors about character. One was with Alan Rickman, and he rang me up and he said, look, I'm spinning plates here. I really need to understand what Snape's underlying. What is he up to? Am I a pure baddie? So he was the only person I told you were in love with Harry's mother, and I talked him through it. 
And I said to him, you are a, you're a double agent. But you do dislike Harry. You, you can't overcome your quite visceral dislike of this boy who looks just like your arch enemy. So I told Alan Rickman what was coming way before it came in the movies. And the other conversation I had was with um, Tom Burke by text. And this was, this was brilliant because it shows how well he understands the character. So it was sort of the other way around because he's telling me what, what the character is. And I'm saying, yes, you are completely right. That's what the character is. So he said to me, what about this, um, this guitar? There's a, in, the, in the TV show, there's a sort of iron, um, sort of stylized guitar on the wall. He said, would Stripe want that? I said, no, 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 he wouldn't want that. But it's, it was too late, you see, when we started filming. So we talked about why Stripe's in Denmark Street. And Tom said to me, I don't think he consciously went to Denmark Street for the music. But I think there was a sort of subliminal influence from his childhood, this felt familiar. And I said, bingo. So we had this little text exchange. And it, when, you, when you're working with an actor, and Holiday's the same, Holiday, Holiday really has a feel for what Robin would or wouldn't do. When you've got an actor, and Alan, Alan was just looking to really inhabit the char character more. When you've got actors like that, that is pure, I mean, that's a joy, working with people like that who really get it and, and want to know more or want to check that their instincts are right. I love that. But no, I, no, an actor is, well, sorry. No, no, an actor has never <laughs> given me an idea for anything like that, no. I could honestly say there are only two characters I've ever fully, properly based on real people. You know, there was one inspiration source, that's it and uh, one of them is Barclay, who is my friend Dave. Yeah, who is Glaswegian, who is very funny, who's very clever. I literally took Dave and obviously I am inventing Barclay's dialogue and I'm inventing, uh, Dave would want me to say I'm inventing Barclay's drug use, previous drug use as well. I'm, you know, obviously I'm, the character is not literally Dave, but he was very consciously inspired by Dave. Mostly it's it's composite, or you might take an aspect of someone's appearance, or you might, which I've, I've often done. I've often had, you know, even seen someone on the tube or something, and that gives you an idea. I don't like killing off characters, but it's part of life, isn't it? Killing Snape was awful. I, I always knew. <laughs> You know, I knew he was going to go. I, but it, yeah, couldn't bear killing Lupin and Tonks. That was so sad. Uh, oh, Fred, and I've now killed off a pretty major character in the Strike books, and which again, I I knew from the start that was going to happen. The question was when, and I thought it might be in book eight, but I decided seven was the right time for it to happen. Let me be very honest. I think I've had some, you know, there's been criticism in reviews through my career that I think was fair criticism. And, and in the sense that I would think, yeah, you're right, that was, that was weak and I can do better. But in terms of being influenced by certain things that reviewers would say, I, I would have to say I'm, yeah, whatever. I'm whatever, for example, with the strike books, this is too long. Well, that's how long it had to be to tell the story I wanted to tell. That's where, that's how I feel. I'm not going to shave off 200 pages because the, the, the book is as long as I want it to be. The book, that's how long it needed to be to tell the story I wanted to tell, you know, that's the way it is. If you don't have faith in yourself as a writer, that is not the same as being so arrogant as to say, no one can edit this, no one's allowed an opinion but you have to decide who you're going to listen to, who you trust, who you think, whose opinion is valid. And I've worked with some amazing editors and I've listened to every single one of them. And I respect what they say to me. And as I say, there are certain reviews where I think, yep, yeah, that's, that's fair criticism. That, that, that wasn't my finest um, work there. I've got six books in my head because I've got the one I'm currently writing, there'll be two more strikes, and then there are three more books that I really want to get to. I always gesture to the back of my head because I feel a lot of it kind of like that. 
I'm sure an MRI scan would prove that it's got nothing to do with the back of my brain, but I always find myself sort of doing this when I'm talking about where it comes from. God knows. But yeah, I do, I do have other stories in my head that I really need to get out there. Yeah.